Okay, well, welcome everyone to today's SOFI seminar. I'm Andrew Patton, the organizer of the series. Today, I am very happy to be hosting Ross Valkanoff from the University of California, San Diego, as our speaker. And his discussion will be Egon Zagrasek from the Federal Reserve Board, uh, currently visiting the Bank for International Settlements in Switzerland. We'll follow the usual format uh, as in previous weeks. So the speaker will have 40 minutes to present, the discussion will have 10, and then we'll have 10 for Q&A uh, at the end. If you have a question during the seminar, you can either use the raise your hand button down at the bottom of your screen, or you can type your question into the Q&A box. And if you'd like me to ask the question on your behalf, just put that in the question, I'll, um, I'll keep that in mind. And I think that's it. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ross and uh, you can begin. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, to be presenting uh, a new work, a uh, new paper uh, from macroeconomic shocks to credit spreads. Uh, it's work with uh, co-authors Martin Boons uh, from Tilburg University and Giorgio Otonello from Nova Portugal. So to give you um, a perspective of where we come from, uh, I wanna uh, start with an overview of this large literature that looks at credit spreads and the macroeconomy. Uh, there is a long established uh, finding uh, and a robust finding uh, in macrofinance that credit spreads lead the macroeconomy. If you take uh, any measure of credit spreads, think of the default spread, the, uh, the basket of BAA bonds minus the basket of AA bonds, uh, and look at this, uh, and you uh, uh, look at how this credit spreads forecast macroeconomic aggregates, you're going to find a good result. The credit spreads lead the macroeconomy. Uh, there's, you know, there's a that literature goes back to before the 80s, actually. Uh, but there's been a lot of interest trying to understand the role of credit markets. Uh, in general, the first parts or the first models uh, in that literature were the, the papers by Bernanke and Gertler and Kiyotaki and Moore that place emphasis on credit frictions uh, that propagate and amplify economic shocks. So you have an economic shocks, and then you have balance sheet channels that propagate uh, the, those shocks. Now, recently, there's been uh, that literature has been, you know, very active. Recently, there have been papers that have taken a, a different tack on this problem. Uh, they've emphasized credit booms and sentiment uh, that are, you know, uh, different from credit frictions uh, that also uh, uh, help to amplify and propagate shocks and lead to this predictability. And there is a third set of models um, that look at more an equilibrium. In an equilibrium setting, they look at credit, uh, pr the pricing of credit risk. Uh, and you know the fact that credit risk should be countercyclical, uh, and those papers have also uh, gotten some traction. But the uh, the, uh, the starting point here was that this you have this uh, uh, empirical finding that credit spreads lead the macroeconomy, and the default spread is is one measure. There have been others. Uh, the we're going to use that, and we're going to use uh, another another uh, credit spread measure by Gilchrist and Zakarczyk. Uh They have a larger cross section of bonds, or they use a larger cross section of bonds that they match. Uh, to, uh, to treasury bills, and they, uh, they estimate the, uh, the credit spread more accurately. So no matter how you slice it, credit spreads forecast the macroeconomy. In this paper, we're going to do the opposite. We are not going to ask whether credit spreads forecast the macroeconomy. We're going to ask whether macroeconomic shocks uh, lead credit spreads and why. Okay? Uh, and that's an important question. Uh, we uh, we do want to understand what leads uh, financial variables, credit markets, and in, in, in particular, macroeconomic shocks being kind of the, you know, the the uh, the, the, the the most important shocks that, that you can think of. Uh, the, um, you know, and you don't have to have uh, frictions in, in in credit markets to propagate the shocks. Even if you have a frictionless economy uh, with rational uh, rational agents. Uh, the credit spread is determined by uh, fundamentals, credit fundamentals, which is defaults, uh, and credit risk premium. And both of those have got to be countercyclical. And how countercyclical they are, which of those two responds to macroeconomic shocks is an empirical question. Okay? Uh, so from a pricing perspective, you can see that this is important. We do want to understand how uh, corporate bonds are priced and what shocks drive corporate bonds. And, and this is basically the foundation of this work. Now, uh, as you see, uh, we are trying to start to, we are making a causal statement, uh, so which, which means we have to identify uh, macroeconomic shocks, and I we call this pure macroeconomic shocks. Uh, so those should be shocks that uh, are not correlated with, with the credit market variables, 
uh, and, and then we want to trace their effects uh, on credit spreads. So to do that, we're going to lean heavily on a literature that identifies macroeconomic shocks. There's been work since the uh, 80s, uh, uh, you know, when uh, we started thinking of VARs and identifying shocks, there's been a lot of work uh, identifying uh, macroeconomic shocks. So what we do is uh, we're going to uh, select shocks that we believe are uh, plausibly exogenous to credit markets. Uh, and we're going to estimate their impulse responses, and we're going to trace out their, their, their effect on credit spreads. Some of the, uh, the shocks that we're going to use are familiar. I'm just going to go quickly through them. Uh, oil supply shocks, of you know, starting with Hamilton and Baumeister and Hamilton, is the paper we're going to use. They, uh, they identify oil supply shocks based on oil production disruptions due to war, natural disasters, and so on. They have a very nice way of doing this. Uh, they have a a reasonably large sample from 75 to 2017. Their shocks are large, uh, and uh, most the most frequent shocks occur in the 80s. Then you can think of defense spending shocks uh, and uh, a narrative way of identifying those shocks. That's work by Valerie Ramey. Uh, so you can think of you know if there's a, a an exogenous war, a conflict, uh, defense spending increases. Uh, that's going to have that might have an effect on the macroeconomy. Uh, Raimi identifies those shocks based on narratives and news. The third shock we're going to use uh, is investment specific technology shocks. Again, you have some uh, technology shock and measuring this technology shock is important. Uh, there's been again a large literature uh, identifying technology shocks. A pap the paper by Benzef and Kahn that we're going to use has been particularly successful ident at identifying uh, technology shocks in a sense that their IST shock, investment spe specific technology shock, uh, forecast GDP growth uh, a few quarters out. And that shock is from the 50s. Uh, the Ramey uh, shock is from the, the 1890s, but most of the, you know, most the large uh, shocks occur around the wars, of course. And the last shock that, you know, uh, should belongs to this category of, of, of macro shocks is monetary policy news. Uh, we use uh, in the same vein uh, the, the narrative approach of Romer and Romer uh, to identify when the news about specific monetary intervention uh, hits and the Gertler and Karate uh, high frequency futures contracts approach. Okay, And they have different, different samples. So think of those shocks as being uh, given to us. We're going to use those shocks. We're not going to redo the work. And we're going to trace out their effects on, on, the, uh, on credit spreads. I'm going to focus on oil defense and IST shocks for, this, for, the, for, the, for the talk. Uh, I'll mention why in a second. Think of a positive shock is good news for the economic growth. A negative shock is, is, you know, is a recession, a contraction. Now, the shocks are very different in their origins, how lumpy they are. Some hit in the 80s, some hit in the 70s and 60s. Uh, and the response, uh, you know, what is the impulse response? Of those shocks on the macroeconomy is different. I think this is a good, you know, this is a good thing in, in my book. It speaks to the robustness of the results. It's not the, our results are not going to be predicated on a specific identification. Why are those shocks macroeconomic? Well, because they affect future macroeconomic activity, and that's uh, Ramey's uh, definition. That's what most people think. You know, if you have a shock and it affects future macroeconomic aggregates, you know, that's by definition a macroeconomic shock. The shock, these shocks are related to, there's an, a, a burgeoning literature on, on identifying macro instrumental variables. It's related to the external instrumental variables approach that uh, was reviewed in Stock and Watson. Uh, external in the sense that the, all those shocks that we've identified are identified using external information, external to the VAR information. Uh, and they're instrumental because you can, you can think of the oil being an instrument for monetary, for macroeconomic shocks. Uh, it's also related to the paper that uh, I enjoyed, uh, he, that was presented here by Gabain Koijan. They look at granular instrumental, uh, instrumental variables for, for the macroeconomy. So it's uh, very much related. Now, the identifying assumption here is that the shocks are exogenous to current and lagged credit markets. So, you know, if you have an oil shock, uh, uh, a conflict, and oil supply is disrupted in some ways, that happens because of, of, of reasons orthogonal to the credit markets. If there is a war conflict and defense spending has to go up, that happens because of, of reasons orthogonal to the credit markets. Okay, so we believe that those shocks, specifically oil defense and IST shocks, uh, are reasonably exogenous. Um, 
Now, we're not claiming that macroshocks exist. We're focusing on macroshocks and their effect. Of course, there's an interesting uh, feedback effect. You know, you can have a macroshocks and how it propagates, how it hits if the credit market and due to, to different channels, it might feed into, into larger effects. But we, we focus on, 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 on the macroshocks. So once we, uh, we can establish that there is a relation between shocks and the effect on credit spreads, uh, now the question is why? Um, and the way we think about it, you know, we can decompose credit spreads into fundamentals. Think of defaults, kind of the numerator, uh, and credit risk premium. Uh, and you can think of, you know, of, of, of reasons why either one of them might be driven by uh, monetary policy, um, by, by macroeconomic shocks. Uh, for example, you know, the uh, fundamentals uh, might be slow adjusting uh, to economic conditions due to certain liquidity costs. Uh, of course, we have reasons to believe that credit risk premia are time varying, counter cyclical. So again, uh, uh, macroeconomic shocks might lead those. A way of uh, validating that, macro, uh, uh, that uh, macroeconomic shocks uh, drive uh, uh, credit spreads is to look at an external asset. Uh, and we look at equities. Uh, and the reason for that is, you know, if you have a macro shocks, uh, they are really common shock. This is the primary example of a systematic large shock. They should impact all assets in the economy. Okay, that's, uh, Cochrane puts it very eloquently in his, in his review article. Uh, surprisingly, the evidence for this co-movement in, uh, in uh, uh, stock risk premium, bond risk premium is limited. Uh, so we're going to try to see if, if we can document that. So moving on, so just to, to be clear, so we have, we're taking those shocks as, you know, given by the authors, and we are tracing the effect uh, of those shocks on spreads. The macro variables that we're going to use, uh, we, we have a few in the paper. I'm going to focus on the Chicago Fed index, which is here uh, in the blue line. It's a, you know, it's a very informative index as, as far as, as macro variables go. Uh, relative to the GDP, the trend of GDP, you see it's much smoother. We're going to use both, uh, but when we have a, cho a, ch a choice, we're, we're going to focus, I'm going to focus on the Chicago Fed index. Uh, in terms of spread, we're going to use the, the, the default spread, the BA minus AAA index. It's uh, uh, you know, uh, available since the 1919. Uh, we're going to use the Gilchrist and Zarachek when you have a choice again. It's used since the 70s, since we've started having um, you know, a large cross-section of data. So to motivate the talk, I'm going to start with simple predictive regressions. And this is basically, the first regression is spreads forecasting macroeconomic variables. Okay, So the spreads, default spread, or the Zarachek spread forecasting macroeconomic variables. And there is, this is basically replicating previous studies. Uh, you can look at the coefficients here plotted. Uh, high spreads, uh, macroeconomic activity goes down. Uh, significance here is colored in black, 1%, 5%. There is a lot of predictability. The uh, GZ, I'm going to start calling it the GZ index. The GZ spread forecast economic, macroeconomic activity one quarter, two quarter, three quarters out. Same for the default, default spread. Uh, you know, with, with a bit uh, less, less success. What we do observe uh, also is that uh, macroeconomic variables, this is the Chicago Fed index, forecast the GZ, the GZ index too. Okay, one, two, three quarters out. Uh, and it also forecasts forecast the default spread. So this is kind of the reverse predictability. Okay, so what we're pointing here is that not only do spreads forecast macroeconomic variables, macroeconomic variables forecast the default spreads. Uh, spreads. So there is a complex lead lag relationship between the two. So which leads us to, you know, to, uh, to need to, 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 uh, to, to ask what are the, the shocks that, that drive uh, this predictability. <clears throat> so in terms of identification, uh, we do two things in the paper. Um, so we look at macro shocks. We have to identify macro shocks. Uh, we can uh, use a VAR, uh, and we do that following uh, Gilchrist and Zakarczyk. Uh, we uh, use a Koleski identification. It's a, a, a simple uh, identification uh, where macro variables respond to to the, to, with a lag to the credit spreads. Uh, and our results from that VAR are very similar to what I'm going to discuss. But so I'm going to leave that uh, for now. I'm, I'm not going to click on this result. Uh, they, they are very, the results are consistent with what I'm going uh, to talk about. I'm going to focus instead on these external shocks, these oil shocks, defense shocks, and uh, technology shocks. 
uh, since they rely on, on weaker than fine assumptions. So how, am I, how are we going to do things? So we have the shocks uh, and we have the variables we're interested in shocking. So we can just uh, run a regression or local projections uh, following Jorda to, uh, to identify the shocks. And what we do find is that <clears throat> if you have a shock to oil, I'm sorry, if you have a shock to, oh yes, to oil, uh, this is uh, oil supply goes up, uh, economic activity increases, that's a positive shock. Uh, at the same time, if you have shock going up, credit spreads decrease, okay? Credit spreads uh, narrow, this is good news for the economy. That happens for the default spread and the GZ spread, okay? So all the units are standard deviations. Um, so this is one standard deviation shock implies the, the, uh, the spread goes down by 0.2 standard deviations, okay? So that's the oil shock. <clears throat> if you look at the uh, IST shock, uh, very similar. Uh, IST, you know, technology shock goes up. That's good news for the economy. Uh, economy responds well. Uh, default spreads narrow. Uh, the credit markets uh, show that. Okay, defense spending, same thing, except uh, all happens with a lag. So, do credit spreads respond to macroeconomic shock? The answer from this uh, uh, VARS is uh, that, that from the impulse responses is yes. For all three distinct shocks that happen, you know, at the different points in time. Uh, the response of the spread is similar in magnitude to, to, the, to the response of the uh, macro variables. So if you, if you say that the shocks should have a, an effect on the macro variables, you know, by the same token, they have an effect on the spreads. They're opposite in science, which, which is what we'd expect from economic theory. And the, uh, the response of the spreads are, are with a slight lag. Okay? Uh, the, the, the effects are uh, yeah, yeah, significant. <clears throat> I'm going to... Um, uh, talk about the uh, uh, monetary policy shock here. Uh, uh, we, at this point, the monetary policy shocks are in the appendix. So because uh, they, um, we, we're trying to convince ourselves that monetary policy shocks are exogenous to, to, to the credit markets. And, and that's uh, not obvious, not with all identifications, but the, with the identifications that we have uh, here by Romer and Romer and Gertner Karate, we are reasonably certain that that, that, that is the case. So in this case, we have uh, you know, expansionary shock, uh, macroeconomic activity increases, and expansionary shock leads to the, to the uh, uh, default spread in this case to, to, to go down. Okay? When we change the shocks, that's due to the sample that we have uh, based on, on the different studies. So Romer and Romer is longer sample. We use the default spread. Gertler and Karate is a shorter sample. We can use the GZ. Okay? The standard errors here that we plot <clears throat> are, are New West. You know, the beauty of this impulse responses is just a pure regression. So standard errors are uh, New West. Okay, so <clears throat> it seems like all four shocks uh, uh, have uh, the expected response to macroeconomic variables. So they are valid instruments of, of, uh, of macroeconomic activity and they have a negative uh, response with respect to uh, to, to credit spreads. And the effects are, if you see, are pretty much comparable. You know, the point to standard deviation with respect to macro, point to standard deviations, negative point to standard deviation with respect to the uh, default spread and GC. <clears throat> so the question is, why do we have this response? Uh, and to answer the white question, we have to have a decomposition. Uh, and we use uh, two decompositions uh, of the uh, credit spreads. Uh, the first decomposition uh, is that of Gilchrist and Zarechek. Uh, they define the GZ, they break the GZ into a part that's due to defaults from MERT model. They have measures of distance to default. They regress the GZ on, Mert, uh, on, that, on, on those uh, variables. And the residuals is um, this uh, uh, excess bond premium that they call, this is any, every excess compensation uh, in beyond this uh, expected default fluctuations, okay? So this is very, very much in the, in the framework of defaults uh, or fundamentals and risk premium. Uh, the second decomposition we're gonna use is uh, by Nozawa, a nice paper in the JF recently. Uh, Nozawa, what he does is he looks at a, a, a VAR decomposition of, of uh, spreads, price spreads, he looks at prices of a, of a corporate bond and a comparable treasury, and he decomposes them using a long horizon restrictions, like Campbell and Schiller type of restriction. Uh, 
uh, and he finds that their, his credit spreads are driven by, you know, are, can be composed into credit losses, again, fundamentals, and risk premium. Okay, so <clears throat> the, in, in both uh, decompositions, you know, the, the decompositions have the same spirit, they have different identifications. Uh, in both, we have a risk premium that are, you know, uh, have different interpretations, and they have, you know, fundamentals that are identified differently. So how do uh, so we can again look at the uh, the, the different components, uh, the, the response of the different components to to the to the shocks. So here I'm, I'm giving you the uh, the GZ the GZ spread, which is what we saw about a shocked oil uh, produces a uh, negative response of the GZ uh, of about minus two standard deviations, about six to seven quarters out. It's a persistent response. Um, and, and kind of dies down. The uh, half of that response, about 0.1 standard deviation of that response is due to the uh, EBP, excess bond premium. Uh, and about half of that is due to the default, the default risk, okay? So default risk is more persistent. Uh, the uh, uh, excess bond premium uh, is somewhat persistent. You know, it goes up to 12 quarters and then dies down, okay? So, there is uh, evidence that some of the responses due to the uh, 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 EBP, and of course, some of it is, is, the, uh, is due to, 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 shock, to uh, defaults. We get a slightly sharper um, distinction with the Nozawa uh, decomposition. Uh, again, the Nozawa uh, uh, gives us a, if we shock the Nozawa credit spreads, we have a response of about 15.17 standard deviations. If we look at the uh, decomposition, most of the action happens because of the risk premium or time varying. Okay, the, the risk premiums uh, vary with uh, with with the, the macro shocks. Okay, about eighty percent of the, the trough response is driven by the risk premium. Okay, so the uh, this is uh, kind of the uh, evidence. Uh, now you might say, uh, you know, if if we have if there is a, this. Uh, fluctuation uh, that's driven by macro shocks, it's gotta be there too around uh, NBR recessions. Uh, and we do this event study uh, magnifying kind of the NBR recessions, which are large uh, shocks that occur much more frequently than, than, than the individual uh, oil shocks and so on. So I wanna see if, if, the, if the, uh, the results are consistent with, with, with that, especially identifying um, the different components of the credit spreads. So what I have here is I've plotted the macroeconomic activity at the at the at the trough of the recession, which is you know uh, the you have basically a recession. Uh, the uh, Chicago Fed index goes down significantly. What would happen to the, the to the, uh, the credit spreads? Of course, they're going to go up during that period. From uh, two years out to the trough of the recession, you're going to have pretty much 1.5 standard deviation change a very large movement in credit spreads. That's in the GZ credit spreads and the Nozawa credit spread is, is, is pretty much the same, it's different units. Most of the variation happens uh, in the, uh, or, or in, you know, due to the, uh, to this uh, excess bond premium. Uh, if, if you look at from minus 0.5 to one, the largest part is due to, uh, to, to the, the risk premium. The default respond very little uh, during, during that time, okay? Same thing. Uh, with, the, with the Nozawa, the risk premium is what responds the most. The recessions, it's counter-cyclical. Uh, so this is, and, and, and the credit losses here are pretty much non-existent, okay? So the Nozawa is really, Nozawa is really paying attention to kind of identifying this, uh, you know, diversifiable uh, default risk uh, and, and seems like this is what we see here. Okay, so the next part we want to talk about is uh, the, uh, this, uh, a way of identifying the shocks, which is uh, using uh, external validity. So the, the question is, if you have a macro shocks and, and it really uh, hits risk premia of corporate bonds, it's gotta be the case that it also impacts the risk premia of equities. Uh, so the question is, do equity risk premium move after the same macroeconomic shocks? Uh, and this is a cool exercise because equities uh, are very difficult to, uh, to uh, work with, equity risk premiums in particular. Uh, you know, attributing, uh, understanding what shocks drive the equity risk premium uh, has been uh, notoriously difficult. So what we, what we want to do is we want to find a proxy of expected stock returns 
uh, and you know we have the default spread as a proxy for bond returns, and we want to see if they can move together. And by the way, this has been done uh, theoretically. Uh, uh, Chen et al. They have a nice paper. Uh, they find the default spreads and the dividend price ratio, which is a proxy for for uh, uh, expected stock returns, are weakly correlated relative to what we would expect from a Campbell and Cochrane uh, model, for example, in a Campbell and Cochrane, if you price those, the uh, uh, corporate bonds and stocks, the correlation is going to be much higher than what you'll get in the data. In the data, you get correlations of, you know, you know 0.3.4, okay? And of course, there's been, there have been many reasons for that. You can think of this as unconditional correlations. There's a lot of things that happen uh, that, that can drive uh, the time, that can drive this, this time variation. Uh, Cash flow sentiment, uh, investors base can shift. They can, can have uh, flight to liquidity, uh, the flow of funds into the two markets. So uh, the beauty of having shocks, looking at shocks, is that when you have a shock, it's unexpected. It you know, de facto keeps everything, all those factors are constant. It looks at just the shock. So what about the uh, co-movement of risk premia? Uh, so what we do have find is that, so this is again, same responses. Uh, we find that uh, shocking uh, oil, looking at the oil supply shocks. Uh, the, uh, again, this is the, the previous graph that I've shown. Uh, Chicago Fed index goes up. The dividend price ratio uh, goes down. This is a detrended dividend price ratio. So think of uh, innovations with dividend price ratio. It go, goes down. Uh, and by about, again, 0.2 standard deviations. This is the same local projections that I'm doing. I'm doing the, the local projections for the default, the uh, I'm sorry, the dividend price ratio rather than than um, you know the spreads. Okay, so the default premium, uh, I'm sorry, the, the the dividend yield goes down because of uh, oil shocks. The dividend yield uh, goes down uh, because of IST shocks, uh, and it also goes down because of defense spending shocks. So the the picture that we have is pretty uniform. That you know uh, across the three shocks, three expansionary shocks, uh, dividend price goes down. Uh, risk premia go down. The risk premia are counter cyclical. Similar uh, picture emerges. So we uh, look at the uh, Campbell and Cochrane risk aversion uh, parameter, uh, which is you know uh, another proxy, perhaps a better proxy for expected stock returns, and we have very very similar results. That was something that previous models could not deliver. Uh, here we have that the uh, uh, shocks to oil. Uh, shocks to IST uh, to uh, technology shocks uh, lead to um, the uh, you know uh, risk aversion uh, going down or expected stock returns go down. I could have plotted here the uh, credit spread response and it would look very similar uh, uh, in terms of magnitude and, and when it hits. Okay, so the uh, the uh, Cool part about this is that if you look at corporate bond uh, uh, returns or co uh, corporate bond yields, most of the literature so, so far has been done with corporate uh, with yields uh, and the decomposition of yields. Now, if you argue that uh, yields are driven by uh, macro variables, you can you'll uh, find that uh, the say the uh, the macro variables and yields should proxy for time variation in in bond returns. Uh, and there's been, uh, you know, in, in finance, perhaps it's more natural to look at the time variation, to, to look for compensation uh, in, 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 in risk premia from uh, return regressions, okay? Uh, so looking at Kim and Stambao, Fama French, uh, those authors, they, they, uh, they uh, proxy for uh, bond risk premia using uh, future returns. So regressing future bond returns uh, on conditioning information on, on uh, this variable, uh, you know, this is, uh, now I'm gonna switch from yields to returns and I'm gonna look at the return, uh, you know, one year out as a proxy for expected returns. And I'm gonna uh, forecast it using uh, macroeconomic variables, namely, uh, you know, Ch Chicago Fed index, uh, measures of, of more, you know, inflation and so on, lag variables of, of returns. Uh, and this return here <clears throat> that I'm going to use is either the market portfolio of corporate bonds in excess of the risk free rate, or I'm going to use, um, I'm going to sort the, the bond returns based on different characteristics, 
Maturity is one way of thinking about it. Ratings is what you'd expect to get the most result out of because you know you, you can sort bonds based on uh, credit risk and and see uh, you know look at high rated bonds minus low rated bonds and see if this uh, credit risk premium uh, is significant. So I'm I'm showing you here the summary statistics uh, of 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 this uh, from this regression uh, from from this uh, from the data. So here's what we get if you, if you look at the uh, predictability results. Uh, this is uh, returns or future returns uh, forecasted, forecasted by uh, macro variables, uh, inflation, and the uh, default spread or the GZ spread. I've uh, omitted the default spread here, so focusing on the GZ spread. So you do observe that macro variables um, forecast uh, corporate bond returns. Uh, the forecastability here is 19%. That's an R square of 19%. Much larger is what, than what you have for stocks. So, it, and this is T stats, new USD statistics. Uh, and the sign is uh, what you'd expect, expe uh, expected corporate bond returns are counter cyclical. Uh, the uh, GZ yield spread forecasts the returns uh, with an expected sign too, it's comparable predictive power, there's a correlation between the two, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, yield spreads and the macro variables are correlated as we've, we've argued, putting them the two together uh, increases the R square uh, by a little bit, okay? For the ratings, you have perhaps the largest uh, impact, the, uh, the uh, uh, market uh, portfolio, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, Chicago Fed index forecast future returns, uh, so does the GZ, the significance is larger in economic, in economic uh, units uh, and the R squares are significant. So the, the message from those regressions uh, is that macro, uh, macro variables and credit spreads predict corporate bond returns. Uh, and this gives us uh, an alternative way of identifying credit risk based on those, based on fundamentals. Uh, there's an overlap in the content of the macro variables and the, in the uh, spreads. Uh, but the, the, uh, it's, it's important to not emphasize the high R square. So if you're coming back to the question of what drives the, uh, the, the, uh, the prices of corporate bonds, these regressions, uh, you know, following the, sh the shock exercises argues that macroeconomic and the macroeconomic risks are the source of it, okay? Uh, and the predictability uh, is, you know, you can see all the coefficients that are remarkably consistent. If you run uh, predictive regressions, you'll know that, you know, they can be finicky. The R square here, R squares here are, are much larger and, and more significant. Okay, uh, so the, the uh, last thing we do is we look at the response of uh, bond returns to macroeconomic shock. So once we've identified expected bond returns or expected uh, bond risk premia, you can ask yourself uh, whether those bond risk, risk premia uh, are driven by, micro, by macroeconomic shocks. Uh, and we do the same uh, local projection, Jorda uh, uh, exercise, when we basically look at an oil shock uh, and the effect of that oil shock on, on, uh, on the measure of expected returns. And the result is very similar. Uh, the response is similar in shape as to the GZ spread uh, and inverse to the uh, Chicago Fed uh, uh, index, uh, and this is respect. This is expected. So what you have is basically we are shocking uh, the same variables de facto because remember the uh, the uh, return loads negatively on the Chicago Fed; it loads positively uh, on the GZ index. So effectively, uh, we are retracing or or replicating what we've done uh, with the yields, except here we are doing it in a, in a, we are having a different uh, linear combination of those two variables. Another uh, interesting uh, uh, exercise that we do in the paper is we look at this evidence of macro spanning. There's an there's a, uh, interesting debate in the uh, treasuries literature uh, whether uh, macro, there's unspanned risk. The idea is that uh, principal components uh, from the treasuries, first, two, second, or three principal components of treasury, treasuries should capture all the information in, 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 uh, for, in you know, that characterize uh, treasury returns. Uh, 
it turns out uh, our evidence shows that uh, there is room for this uh, macro risk. And that's perhaps not surprising because there's no uh, compelling arguments why macro risk should not be spent here. You don't have this tight link between a pricing, uh, equ the pricing uh, equation or the pricing of, 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 of corporate bonds uh, and, and the principal components. So to, uh, to show you that, um, what we have here is we've looked at the uh, expected corporate bond returns uh, and we've extracted principal components from a cross-section of corporate bond returns, first three principal components. Uh, and we are fitting a regression and uh, modeling the, uh, the expected returns of the market uh, uh, portfolio based on, on time to maturity, ratings, and size. And we do the same thing using the regressions that I showed you, which is uh, <clears throat> from using, uh, uh, as, uh, using as predictors just the uh, Chicago Fed index and inflation. And as you can see, the two, the two uh, graphs are very similar right on top of each other that are that shows you that a lot of the information that's captured in the principal component is also captured in, in those macro variables. So there's some uh, room for, for macro spanning. Okay. So to conclude exactly on time, uh, the argument what well, the argument that we made in this paper is that macro shocks lead credit spreads. Uh, macroeconomic uh, shocks identified from the previous literature lead credit spreads. Uh, the response uh, that, that we observe is due to uh, time varying credit risk premium more so than, than uh, defaults, uh, which leads us to, to, uh, to believe that it's really this, uh, this time variation in, in uh, risk premium that we're capturing. Uh, it's been uh, hard to, to, uh, to, uh, to pin it down. We have it, uh, you know, this uh, counter cyclicality in a very nice way. Remember the, the regression, the uh, impulse responses that we have, this Jordan impulse responses are pure regressions. There's nothing that hardwires this, this counter cyclicality. Uh, we find that equity risk premium responds to the same shocks. Uh, it's a, uh, you know, a result that, that uh, is, is, is a, we, we find uh, compelling. Uh, so there's a co movement between uh, uh, credit risk premium and equity risk premium to the macro shock. So the macro shocks are truly macro in a sense. Uh, and we find that corporate bonds exposure to macro shocks translate into significant bond return predictability. It's, it's a different way of looking at, at this impulse responses. So the two are basically the same. Uh, so this is uh, you know, uh, the uh, compelling, ev uh, compelling evidence. When do you take it from here? The, the causal link um, that we have with these external shocks uh, is uh, important to kind of add on to the literature that already exists. So you, you remember the Bernanke and Gertler hypothesis that they were thinking of, you know, we have a mac economic shocks that that's amplified by frictions or by sentiment in other papers. So that's, that's basically what we are, we are showing that there is the macro shocks that affects the credit market. Uh, modeling this amplification mechanism from macro shocks to the credit market and that how, how that's amplified would be interesting. Uh, also, the effect on financial intermediaries, uh, balance sheets uh, and uh, intermediaries uh, leverage is important. That's been another literature. We do show that uh, uh, those, the shocks, uh, um, uh, macroeconomic shocks do not uh, impact uh, balance sheet and, and leverage, uh, but there's more work to be done uh, on, on that topic. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Ross. That's great. And that's right on time as well. So we'll turn it straight over to our discussant, Egon. And I realized I think I mispronounced your name, Egon. So I apologize for that. Uh, it's all right. <laughs> I'm used to that one. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a mouthful to say the least. <laughs> can you, can you, you know, should I share the screen or do you still yeah. have me on? Uh, please go ahead. Okay. We're good? Great. Okay. All right. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Andrew, for inviting me uh, to the seminar series uh, and to discuss this really nice paper by uh, Ross and, and his co-authors. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a very polished paper. Uh, 
uh, it was sort of a, you know, it's very, very hard to quibble with, it, it, there's very little low hanging fruit, I would say, uh, about the paper and stuff like that. The author did a really nice job. I mean, it's very well written. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to read. There's a lot of, there's a lot of very interesting material in. So let me, um, um, let me try to, let me try to offer some constructive suggestions and, and, uh, and, and some comments on the paper. Uh, first, I should just know there's the usual disclaimer that don't take anything I say seriously in, in, in from a policy perspective. Um, so this is a, you know, just to put a little context around this, um, this is obviously a very, very central uh, question, what the paper is about. What is the relationship between credit markets and the macroeconomy? I think as Ross, you know, uh, put it, uh, this literature received an enormous impetus, you know, following the global financial crisis, where credit markets or financial markets were the center, the epicenter of, of, of the turmoil. And, 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 you know, we also experienced a very, very serious recessions. Um, I think one, kind of a useful thing um, just to set is I want to kind of say, I think when I say, what do we know? I would say sort of a, maybe like three very non-controversial, uh, you know, facts or empirical facts um, that, that I think are very well, you know, that I think very few people would argue with. One is, is that credit market indicators. And what I mean is credit market indicators, I just don't mean spreads. I mean, in generally conditions in credit markets, are very, very informative. They're useful predictor of economic activity. There's no causal statement in here. I'm just talking about purely from an information content. Uh, they're just powerful predictors. Uh, and what I mean by indicators, obviously spreads are very, very, you know, um, kind of an obvious indicator of credit markets, conditions in credit markets. But other things are also quite important. For example, changes in bank lending standards, okay, or terms on, on, on loans. So things having to do with, you know, kind of supply, supply of credit seem to be very useful predictors in a statistical sense for you know, near-term uh, evolution of economic activity. Um, the, so if we narrow on the kind of a set of credit market indicators, which Ross was, you know, uh, discussing in, in the paper, in the corporate bond spreads, is, is that, you know, turns out that, you know, a lot of this predictive power, in fact, you know, significant majority of that is, is actually attributable to the variation in discount rates as opposed to cash flows, okay? So it's something about the, the risk premia, okay, that, that is. So we, there's, that's pretty well known as well. And, um, and then there's the kind of the macro effect, which is, is that, um, you know, by, by affecting the effective supply of credit, you know, shocks, so kind of orthogonal shocks, whatever that, you know, how you can identify them to the credit risk premia or sentiment or things like that, you know, are also induce very, very significant economic downturn. So I just want to kind of keep this in mind because their literature, I mean, uh, Ross's and his, their co-author paper really fits in uh, very much, you know, into, into some of these, you know, facts. In many ways, they confirm many of those facts and they, they provide additional evidence to this. So, what they what they uh, what what they do in their paper is they kind of ask a bit of a reverse questions. I mean, it says is to what extent do traditional business cycle shocks cause fluctuations in credit spreads and why? Okay, and that's a, that is an important because all of the previous literature just, just assumes that that's the case. Credit spreads are asset prices. So of course, they're forward looking asset prices. They should incorporate all of this information. In fact that could account for mo why they have the predictive power because they anticipate future macroeconomic shocks. So it's a purely reverse causality, right? And, um, and you know, the really thing has been trying to partial out, trying to rule out where that reverse causality goes in a, prim in a previous literature. So what they, what they focus uh, in their paper is sort of like three empirical, broad uh, empirical uh, frameworks. One is this reverse predictability regressions, is it spreads to M, what the previous literature has done, M is macroeconomic activity here, and they're going to focus more from M to spreads in the future. They're going to then look at beyond this sort of a reverse predictability regressions in trying to think hard about macro shocks. So they're going to use both kind of standard recursive VAR identifications, as well as local projection methods with external instruments. And then uh, one part that I've, you know, very it was kind of very new, uh, particularly for more of a macro person rather than a finance person, is they also do many of the couch, many of these result, results in a kind of two-step two bond return predictability framework, which is, I think, in terms of expected bond returns, not credit spreads, which is kind of a 
a different empirical way that's I think more finance oriented way of looking at some of these questions that I think it's also very nice, provides a lot of corroborative evidence that is consistent with the previous stuff. Uh, what do they find? I think the main finding is, is that, you know, response of credit spreads to macroeconomic shock is counter cyclical. I would say, thank God that they found that. I think if they did not, <laughs> we would be, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we should probably all just maybe quit and go home and I should just go become a ski instructor here in Switzerland. Um, the, they also find that the response of credit spreads to macroeconomic shock is large, largely due to the shock-induced movements in the credit risk premium, um, which is, you know, so there's this really, really strong evidence of time variation in expected returns that's being driven by, by fundamental shocks in some sense. And one nice result that I think is very nice in the paper is that's been, Ross, you know, kind of a highlighted, that's been a bit elusive, I think, particularly in the finance literature, is, is that these fundamental macroeconomic shocks are, um, you know, an important source of common variation in discount rates in both equity and credit markets. And that's a nice result because, you know, I mean, if you think about bonds and, you know, firm issuing bonds and equity, right, these are claims on the same asset. So there should be, you know, there uh, the, the ought to be this commonality. And I think that has been certainly more elusive in, in, in finance. Um, in terms of comments, let me turn into comments. So the big thing here is this external shock. So let me just uh, spend this is kind of my main comment, then I'm gonna have a little more, you know, kind of smaller uh, comments. Like I said, there's not too much, there, there's very little low hanging fruit in this paper. Uh, it's very it's very polished. So they, they look at three shocks that they primarily focus. One is the kind of oil supply shocks uh, based on a very influential paper by uh, Jim Hamilton and, and, and Baumeister. Uh, defense spending new shock, again, influential work by Valerie Ramey, uh, and it is investment specific technology uh, or ISD new shocks that are based on a paper uh, by Benzev and Khan. Um, the argument is that they want to they want they want to they want to focus on shocks that are a bit arm's length from um, from credit markets. Okay, so these are kind of non policy real shocks that are you know plausibly exogenous to credit markets. I, I'm very comfortable with that, with the idea of that, you know, in the oil, for the oil, these are oil supply shock. I also think the defense spending new shocks are something that are largely outside of what's going on in credit markets. They're really driven by, as Ross said, by, you know, war. Um, I, I will take a little bit of an issue with this investment specific technology shock in macro, okay? And in, so there's a, there's a lot of literature in macro um, that, that focuses on this investment shock, broadly speaking, as fundamental drivers of a business cycle. And what this, what this literature has done, it has sort of a think of two types of investment shock. One are, one are these investment specific technology shocks. So they affect transformation of consumption into investment goods. So that's just the price, the relative price of investment goods or the inverse of that. That's how that is proxied, okay? And then there are also these marginal efficiency of investment shocks, okay? These shocks affect transformation of installed capital from investment goods. So these are more about the transformation of savings into capital, okay? So, um, you know, in, in models, in a very kind of a influential paper that kind of started this literature by Alejandro Giustiniano, Giorgio Primiceri, and Tambalotti, Andrea Tambalotti, is, is they have a very, very kind of a, you know, nice model which puts both of these shocks together. And uh, so once you have both of them together, what turns out is, is, is that this marginal efficiency of investment shocks, this it's not about the relative price of investment goods, but about the transformation of savings into capital, are kind of the key things, okay? Is the and, and the MI shocks look very much like shocks to credit spread. They look like something about a financial financial disruption in the intermediation process, okay? Um, so I think what that means is, is that I think the literature in a macro world is a lot less clean about which of these shocks you know, are important. And if you're gonna look at investment technology, investment, investment specific technology shock, often they, they, it's, it's hard to disentangle general investment shocks from financial shocks. So my sense here is that this is not the most arm's length from credit markets. Um, and even the way it's implemented, the way um, the Ben, ben Ziv and Com paper does is, is that the default spread that uh, Ross says is actually kind of a very important variable in the VAR with, you know, in 
kind of a complicated VR. So the shock in some sense is, is identify using credit spread data. So it's almost a little bit self-referential. So I think this needs to be this, but I'm very comfortable with sort of the oil supply shocks as well, the defense, defense spending shocks as being this. The IST shocks are a little more, I think, questionable in that. Um, let me now just offer just a few quick comments about this. In this return predictability regressions, um, you know, Ross, you know this very well. You want to control for lags of ST in these regressions. I think they kind of overstate maybe the degree of the predictability um, that is a standard because in the other regressions from S to M, we always control for lags of M. So that would be the things. Um, I would be, uh, we can discuss how you measure, you know, how you want to do the detrended output. I would say this Chicago Fed National Activity Index, it's a little tricky, right? This is based on some kind of principal components. It's estimated, it has a bit of a look ahead bias and stuff like that just by construction. And I think I would be, um, you know, maybe just using kind of non transformed variables like that would be perhaps better. Uh, when you look at structural VARs, um, you know, bivariate variables, just M and ST. I'm not sure what do I think of a recursive, what do I think of a macroeconomic shock? I know in the appendix you produce, you know, kind of a higher dimensional VARs. Some of them do not, you do not have prices, inflation, that's an important source of macroeconomic risk. I think I would control that. It's very simple to do. And, you know, I'd also control sort of a monetary policy, but ahead of the identifying assumption is I would put those variables ahead of credit spreads and not afterwards, okay? You can do this in standard macro. We estimate these VARs in level, pick up all the kind of co-integrating relationship and you know everything goes through. That would just be more standard. I think you would be speaking to the macro literature much better. My final stuff here on the return predictability regressions, I know the finance people are very you know, keen about doing this stuff with non-overlapping data. Um, it would be nice to see that as a robustness check um, because that is kind of a really important. Uh, I was sort of a surprise that you only focus on corporate bond returns to oil supply shocks. Uh, what, what happened to other shocks? I was missing other figures. That, that just it seems like you kind of dropped the other shocks, defense spending shocks and stuff like that. It, 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 it would be nice to see that. Um, a, different, a different thing of how to gauge the economic significance of these things is, is that, you know, rather just sort of looking at the impulse response would be also try to compute some kind of forecast error variance decomposition, okay? And the reason why I'm sort of saying is, is that it would be nice to see how much of that is explained by these macroeconomic shocks at different horizons, in particular because, as you kind of pointed out in your last slide, you know, if that source of variation is, you know, not that big, or even if this, there's a lot left over, probably R squared tell you, you know, you're not explaining everything. So there may be still an enormous or at least significant portion of the cyclical you know, uh, business fluctuations could be attributed to the exogenous variations in the risk premia. And you know, this is exactly where I think as a profession we need to understand what could cause that. So thank you very much for your time. All right. Thanks very much for that, Egon. That was great. Great discussion. Ross, maybe you'd like to respond to a couple of points. Yes. Uh, Igor, uh, fantastic uh, discussion. Thanks a lot. If you don't mind sharing the slides with me after, it would be, it would be great. Sure. Uh, a couple of uh, answers. So uh, we were very happy that um, we found counter-cyclicality. Uh, and, you know, it's definitely one of the things that you'd want to find. But in finance, as you know, there are things that, uh, you know, you think are first principles, for example, the risk return trade-off. Uh, and yet yeah, there's very little evidence of that. So. The, uh, here, the, uh, the fact that we have those shocks, uh, at least the shocks that, that we agree are uh, you know, exogenous, the oil shocks and, and the new shocks, finding that they have the expected effect uh, without any constraints, we find nice. Uh, about the IST shocks, a fair point, we were thinking this is kind of stretching this exogenoidic. I always think of exogenoidy as a, spe exogeneity as a spectrum. This is kind of perhaps on the wrong side of the spectrum, so we should, we should think about uh, what to do with it. And the AMI, I sh with other shocks, we've, we've, uh, we are playing with those as well. Uh, in terms of uh, including lags in the, in the predictive regressions totally, we, we thought of this predictive regressions as being motivation, but even in the motivation, we have to include lags. I, I, I totally agree. We figured that the lags would be in the VARs and so on. Um, in terms of uh, um, uh, having more complete uh, vector autoregressions, we, we, uh, we should do that. We, uh, we thought of having a parsimonious VARs, uh, given that some of the shocks are, you know, uh, for a short sample, uh, we'll try our luck with, the, you know, a, a few more variables in the VARs. That, that's not a problem. Uh, and I'm, uh, I am um, 
it's kind of a shame you, you, you talked about non-overlapping with re, uh, returns and i have a paper on that so what I, I say people should correct for that uh we have quarterly vari variables here so we'll try again we have new us uh the overlap is not too bad it's uh, just four quarters four quarters so but uh but you know we'll definitely put it in in the appendix but uh again great thanks for the, for the, the comments nice paper enjoyed nice. it Okay, well, we have a little bit of time for, for questions if anyone would like to ask them. Um, I don't see any hands raised as yet. So maybe while people find the raise your hand button, let me ask a question, uh, Ross. So I know yes. in this Jorda local projections framework, you can also allow for non-linearities. Did you experiment with that at all? At least no. with higher frequency data? We haven't. We and, and we, and we should at this at this point. Uh, the only high frequency data that we have is this uh, Gerther and Karate uh, paper. But most most of the data that we have at, at, at this point are uh, at quarterly frequency, uh, yeah. and the sh and the shocks that we have are very clustered in different periods. So different, you know, for example, the oil shocks happen mostly in the '80s, and fitting anything non-parametric there would be pushing it. Uh, the defense spending shocks happen, you know, in the first part of the sample up to the Korean War. So again, there are a few very large shocks. So this is this is a very kind of a nice illustration of this uh, granular shocks. There, you know, there are a few of those that move markets, uh, and but they're different shocks at different points in time. So yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, I'm just understandable. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, if we don't have any other questions from the audience, maybe this is a good place to end the informal seminar. And if you'd like people to stick around, we can um, we can move to the informal session once we end the, the recording. But before we do that, um, let me do a quick advertisement for the next SOFI seminar. So the next SOFI seminar will be in 2021. So this is the last SOFI seminar of 2020, but uh, we will fortunately run for back uh, in 2021 with virtual seminars. And the next uh, speaker will be Rene Garcia from the University of Montreal, and his discussant will be Tyler Muir from UCLA. So in the meantime, uh, have a good winter break if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, summer break if you're in the South, and wet break if you're somewhere in the middle. And I'll see you all, uh, I hope, in early 2021.